Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in the Shred Gaming Citicom video, we're going to be interviewing NVIDIA's Neil Trevitt, who serves as the company's vice president of mobile ecosystems, along with dual duties as the president of the Kronos Group. So I'd like to extend thanks once again to Neil for this interview. This is a two-part interview. This particular part focuses very much on NVIDIA, with the second part more on Kronos related questions such as OpenGL, Vulkan, game development, and much more besides. Um, okay, I'm going to ask you a couple of NVIDIA related questions, and then if we've got time, we'll circle back to a couple of last Kronos questions. Sure. Because I know a lot of people are going to be kind of interested in some NVIDIA questions, so I'm going to ask a couple of quite... Uh, I, I, these are not like um, NDA type of stuff, so you don't have to worry. I'm not going to ask you when Pascal's going to be released or anything like that. <laughs> but, um, but I'll let is... you know if I can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just say NDA, 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 abort, abort. <laughs> but, <laughs> so NVIDIA have obviously been, well, busy, and that's to put it mildly, especially over the last year. Um, it's even before Pascal dropped, actually, to be fair. Um, it was... You've moved uh, into HBC, and this is obviously over the last several years, not just yet last year, but you've moved into HBC, data center, automotive, desktop, laptop gaming. So I, I'm kind of wondering, uh, and I, I assume a lot of people are as well, what's it like actually being at NVIDIA, working at NVIDIA, and what kind of helps motivate you all to drive you forward to kind of create this technology and, uh, you know, being part of the industry? What What is it that kind of gives you your passion and uh, to kind of, create this cool stuff? That's a great question. I think the that there's no doubt, as you've identified that you know, if, for those of us that were working at, at NVIDIA five or ten years ago, you know, the, we were doing one thing. We, we were doing graphics, basically. You know, and then compute with CUDA started coming. But but to, the, the NVIDIA today is is much broader than that. As you say, we're doing everything from self-driving cars to you know, data center, neural nets. Da, da, da. Um, I even have some people come up to me and say, it, "I say, well, you work for Nvidia. Nvidia, that's the um, that's the uh, artificial intelligence company." <laughs> yeah. I go, "Yes, that's right." <laughs> and they're not actually wrong. That's the scary they're, thing. They're not actually wrong. That's right. They're not actually wrong. But it is a kind of a culture shift for those of us that have been there for a while. But I think the Underneath all of that, the, the, the passion is unchanged. And that is, um, you know, our DNA is GPUs. And we're just finding more and more ways to use GPUs to solve more and more problems. And it, it's not a, it's not a big, um, 180 degree shift. If people are, came to NVIDIA because they were, like in graphics, they by definition like GPUs and now it's not such a big step to say, well, it's cool. Now we can use GPUs for doing, you know, deep learning, uh, training and inference. And that's, you know, the, the heart of automotive, uh, of group doing autonomous driving. So it, it seems like it's a big shift, but actually it's just an extension of what we were doing before and finding more ways, more problems to solve, uh, in the industry, you know, with the technology and the passion that we have. You know, I, I watched a, a conference. I think it was uh, it was mid this year, and I don't remember which one it was. But uh, Jensen Hong obviously was on stage, and uh, he was showing a demonstration essentially of artificial intelligence and how um, machines learn, so machine learning. Yeah. And it was a very simple demonstration. I don't mean that in like you know it was not difficult to achieve. I mean like the demonstration, you know, in terms of concept, was very simple. You had a robot that was trying to sink a golf ball into, obviously, a hole. And uh -huh. at the beginning, obviously, uh, the robot golfer was about as good a golfer as I am. <laughs> so it kept <laughs> consistently missing. You know, it just didn't know how to even hit the ball. And right. after, you know, several hundred attempts, I don't know how many, to be fair, but it was not only hitting the ball, it was making the shot every single time. And then uh, Jensen basically pointed out that I'm pronouncing that correct, right, Jensen? I'm pretty sure I'm Jensen. pronouncing it. Yeah, Jensen. okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I don't want to be disrespectful and uh, say his name wrong like, throughout this video. So uh, after that, he then pointed out that you could simply take that that knowledge that the robot has learned, that it's learned by itself. So it's not like you programmed all of this. Okay, you programmed the basics, but since then it's it's learned 
you know, the tasks by itself, then you yeah. can take that and you can just, I, I, obviously this is fast, it's simplifying it, but you can almost copy and paste it to create multiple instances of this robot. So it's almost like, you know, I create a wallpaper on in Photoshop and then you say, hey, that looks cool, Paul. Can I have a copy of that? And I say, sure, and I just send you the JPEG. Now, obviously, it's a lot more different because it's a robot, but it's 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 just insane how far along we are now when it comes to deep learning and AI and self-driving. It's just, it, it just boggles the mind. Yes. it's It's a paradigm shift where you don't have to manually program all those smarts. You can teach a system those smarts, which is, after all, that's how we, you know, how you teach a baby, right? You don't program when you infant, you, you, you teach it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's exactly the same. And the fact that we don't worry about how we explicitly program all the corner cases and the nuances, we just teach it with enough examples, it will learn that by itself, it is you know, greatly liberating. And I think that is for you know, that kind of task, it's the it's the fundamental shift. We don't have to you know, program every possible you know, uh, in, input and output. We can just keep training it until it is better than we are at, you know, at any particular kind of pattern recognition based task. And that's it's quite similar as well because um, obviously the move into HPC, the market with NVIDIA was pretty pretty obvious. I mean, it now it's I think pretty much because uh, I I do some client work as well and like if I'm running Windows Azure or whatever, obviously a lot of those uh, solutions offer GPU compute, which obviously NVIDIA kind of pioneered. Yeah, but. Uh, so I guess the move into that, when you've got this ridiculous amount of computing power, and obviously the fact that you, I think it was the 8000 series that really put out the unified shader architecture of memory serves. You yeah. know, beforehand, you know, you had the the original, you had the original GPU, which is where obviously they bought things like uh, triangle and lighting from the CPU and put that onto the GPU, and then obviously with unified sh shaders. Now a shader for those who don't know, you have a um, a shader which beforehand. Uh, you would have like dedicated hardware for like texturing and dedicated hardware for like um or a specific part of the GPU for texturing and all this stuff. But now of course you've got unified, which means shaders can work on pretty much anything. Therefore it was logical that, hey, the GPU is pretty fast at doing stuff, right? So we can right. kind of have it doing all this other stuff. So what was the kind of the motivation to go from that to then AI and automotive and mobile? Was it just kind of like uh, in video, was it kind of just like a natural, oh, this makes sense? Or did someone kind of just raise their hand one day and say, hey, look, why don't we try doing this? I think it was uh, a natural convergence. E even before uh, uh, deep learning uh, became a recognized thing, NVIDIA had been um, working, exactly as you say, to make the, both the GPU architecture and the programming of a GPU architecture more general, uh, less specific to just you know, a fast graphics pipeline, to uh, taking much more generalized computing tasks and executing them as quickly as possible uh, on the GPU. And that was that was something that we'd started before deep learning, and we were going to keep going, you know, even if we'd never heard of you know, if deep learning had never happened in the world. Now, we would continue to do that because there's definitely applications um, for fast compute, obviously. Uh, you know, HPC being the most obvious one in you know, supercomputers is the, is the poster child of that. But all the way down through uh, all the different markets, you know, even on mobile phones, you know, I can apply a filter to my uh, picture faster if I use the GPU than if I um, use the CPU. I use less power. So that was something that was going to happen anyway. And then deep learning came along. And you know, the history of deep learning is... It's been going for 20 years. Now, it's it's had its own evolutionary thing in in parallel with GPUs getting faster. But the breakthrough moment was when they tried running the, the deep learning inferencing and training on a GPU rather than the CPU. Because the problem that the deep learning community had was they kind of understood to do a lot, but it was way too slow to be practi practically useful. And then... When they tried and figured out how to use CUDA to run it on a GPU, suddenly 
all their research and their knowledge that they've accumulated over 20 years suddenly became fast enough to be really useful. And that was the ignition point. That's So deep learning didn't just happen you know, five years ago. It's been, it's been happening much longer than that. But practical, fast enough deep learning it happened five years ago, three years ago, four years ago, <laughs> so around that time frame. Um, because it was married with GPU acceleration, and that, that's what's caused this, you know, the AI um, renaissance or birth um, in, in the market um, over the last few years, is bringing those two things together. I mean, it, it's quite weird because uh, from the PC side of things, I remember several years ago, and a lot of a lot of viewers who have kind of been PC gamers for a while, uh, like let's say 2007-ish, 2008-ish, you remember that the Xbox 360, PS3, the PS, the PC was in a pretty bad place for developers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like it, it was almost like the the stepchild that no one loved. Almost, it, like if you got a port, you were damn lucky to get a port. Forget 60 FPS. You're lucky. If, you're lucky if you got 30 a lot of the time, and the textures right. weren't really that different. But I remember that. NVIDIA, you know, and AMD to their credit, and a couple of other companies, but NVIDIA was certainly one of those companies that uh, really pushed it through and kind of helped the PC kind of continue in the in the game marketplace. So yes. do you think, um, what do you think actually really helped it thrive now? Like, what, what do you think the PC is kind of thriving so much more now than what it was like in 2007, 8, 9? For gaming? I, yeah. think, it's, I think it's simple. The um, the consoles have a completely different evolutionary model to the PC, and it's both a strength and a weakness. You know? So you look at the evolutionary path of a PC, it's basically a straight line that goes up, up right? And because every few months there'll be new CPU, there'll be new graphics board, you can plug it together, you can choose when to upgrade, and I don't have enough performance on my rendering, I'll put it in the new graphics board, da, 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 da. so it's very incremental. Consoles, on the other hand, you know, they define a platform that's very stable, and that that platform can be unchanged for you know, five years or more. I mean, it, back in the early console days, it, they, that that console would be out there uh, for a long time before it would get step function in in you know, the, the new console version would come out. You get a step, step function in performance, but whilst that console was shipping, you were basically stuck at that level of performance. Now, the, the plus side of the console model is that it can be easier for developers because it's, it is a fixed platform. You know exactly what it is. It's not going to change. You know, someone is, you don't have to cope with a whole range of different graphics boards. <laughs> so it's a simpler target from that respect. It's better and stably defined, which means, you know, uh, developers do an extraordinary amount of optimization for you know, a volume console because it's worth it because you know it's, that optimization is going to be relevant for the life of that console. But I think if it, so. Those two models running together. What's happened it, more recently is that the PC just keeps incrementally upgrading. Now, if I want the best performance, I obviously buy a PC. The, the PC is outstripped the, the basic performance of, of consoles because we can always be integrating the latest technology. Um, and you know, there's, it turns out that there's a surprisingly large people that really care about having the great, even, even the best uh, performance, 4K you know, and all the rest of it. Um, I, was, I was actually shocked, to be honest. I, I genuinely thought... I mean, this is a slight insight to the viewer type of situation that we've got, but I genuinely thought most people would be interested in, like, the GTX 1060, for example, or whatever. But the amount of questions I get for people who are going to be buying a 1080, or what do I need to run a 144 hertz, you know, um, 1440p display? My Mm -hmm. budget is X. I was... Now, I'm not saying it's higher. There are still an awful lot of people, obviously, who are buying the 1060s or the, you know, the RX 580s or whatever. But disproportionately, 
much fewer than what I anticipated. There's so many more people who really do want to push the 4K because right. obviously now games just look, I mean, you can get like a 4K TV, for example. Um, obviously it's not, you know, 144 hertz, but they're still reasonably cheap. And you see something like Rise of the Tomb Raider on 4K with HDR as well. It just looks like, wow, this looks right. amazing. Right. And um, exactly, I agree. And VR is just going to push that even further. Because with VR, you, you know, you, the, the payback on having better rendering, faster rendering, faster frame rate, lower latency is even more than if, you know, going to a 4K resolution. You need it. Because like you were saying before, if you don't have it, you get ill. <laughs> this is a big motivation. No, but, 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 but seriously, I mean, the VR is, has an inexhaustible need for more pixels, more pixels, faster pixels. Um, so yeah, it's just going to, accelerate the need uh, for higher end uh, performance so I think this is a trend that's going to strengthen do you think one I mean back in the day I, I, this is my personal opinion but back in the day like one of the consistent concerns that people had with, with gaming uh, on the PC of course is that it was you know you were going to get like the BSODs or oh, I have to configure the graphics options oh it doesn't have this or why do I have to hack that you know to to put in more than 60 hertz or you you know what I'm talking about you know performance related issues but now you have services like Steam love it or hate it Origin love it or hate it you play you know you've got obviously um, Humble Bundle which are giving away a ludicrous amount of games on their monthly bundle. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So not only are PC games cheaper, but you've got excellent services. And perhaps most importantly, and this is definitely something that I know, whether it's the Linux community or whether it's, you know, a standard Windows person. I mean, for example, I will get questions with people who are looking to buy a Ryzen 7, just for example, or Fred Ripper, or, you know, a, a, an X299 platform, and of course they want the best, uh, you know, cooler, and they want to water cool their, you know, their new Vega or whatever. Mm-hmm. But an awful lot of people don't actually care that much. All they want to do is they want a decent AIO to run, you know, their Ryzen rig or whatever, so it doesn't make a load of noise. They just yep. want to put their graphics card in, they want to do a quick bit of tweaking. They might do a very general overclock, and that's it. And I think, yep. do you think that's one of the reasons that NVIDIA has been successful? Because obviously, you know, you've got GeForce Experience. You can just click a button. And obviously, some people do want to tweak. Some people don't like GeForce Experience. But an awful lot of people, they don't care. That's the thing. All they want to do is they just want to press a button. The game sets, you know, the quality. So it sets the quality settings for the game. And that's it. They just want to press a button and then just be in, and they don't want any hassle. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, and the nice thing about you know, G, uh, the GeForce experience, you don't force people to use it. So if they want to tweak and tune, they can do that to their, to their heart's content. But I think the majority of people, I mean, I build my own PCs. I use um, uh, GeForce experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's, yeah, uh, it, why not? It, it's making it, because that was one of the big advantages of the console. You would just plug in the cartridge or plug in the disc or download. It was, it was going to work. No, no, no fuss, no muss. And you know, PCs being um, very fiddly and you had to really fight and be an expert to get things to work. That's God, not... men maker oh. back in the day. Like, <laughs> tweaking, tweaking like the auto, um, you know, the, the configs and just like, oh, I don't have enough memory. Oh, you know what? This game doesn't actually need a mouse. I can do without the mouse. I'm going to unload the <laughs> mouse driver. Uh, but I, I, I need sound. I can't not have a sound driver. Right. What do I need? Right. No, I, I, I think for the majority of people, that is an unnecessary amount of hassle. Uh, it's much better to let people enjoy the games easily. Um, you know, and the GeForce experience is good. It 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 is a, a large part of why I think the PC is now a gaming platform rather than a a, a tweaker's delight, because it it removes a lot of the the hassle, which is which is vital. Do you think? Um, um, I don't know if you could talk about this, but Nvidia were quite heavily criticised back in the day for GameWorks. Now, personally, I, I didn't have any problems with the game, but Batman Arkham Knight was notorious. Now, uh-huh. I ironically had zero issues, which really annoyed a couple of my friends, by the way. 
<laughs> now, I, I was playing the game and I was like, what are you talking about this frame rate hitching? I'm fine. And I had like, and the irony as well is that I was actually running like, I think it was an R9 390 or a 480X. I don't remember what, but I had that in and, you know, I had all the settings at max. Uh, including the game work stuff that obviously wasn't exclusive to GeForce cards, and I had everything at max at like, uh, I think it was 1080 or 1440p, I don't remember what, and I had, you know, the odd frame rate hitch here or there, but it was, it was fine, nowhere near the levels of problems that, you know, people were reporting. So do you think that, I, I've noticed though in recent times, CUDA especially is becoming a lot more open, GameWorks is becoming a lot more open, what was it that kind of brought that decision? Was it something the the kind of nudging from the guy, from you and other Kronos guys, or was it just kind of like you kind of realised that you know we we need to open ourselves up, especially obviously uh, as you said with deep learning and um, well games themselves and neural net and all of this stuff. Do you, it, was it just kind of like it was a natural progression? Yeah, I mean it's building an ecosystem about anything, you know, with gaming or deep learning is it, it's never trivial and you're always trying to get the right balance between being open and you know, uh, investing in things yourself um, and it, there's never a correct answer um, you know, and as, as you say you know, NVIDIA is using you know, a lot of different approaches to you know, en enable ecosystems you know, the most interesting one perhaps is the, the we've open sourced our um, neural net inferencing engine you know, that's like a big chunk of technology that we've now opened up because you know, we've come to the conclusion that if you don't do that, the, the deep learning ecosystem is going to be uh, really held back and that's that's not good for, for anybody. Um, I think it's definitely good. You know, Gameworks is an interesting example. It's definitely good that you know, NVIDIA is investing in how to use the GPU for developing more and more interesting you know, visual and rendering uh, and game effects, um, and making that available to the developers. But as you say, if, if the ecosystem can't absorb it and you get Arkham, uh, type experiences, that's not good either. And so, you know, making it a little bit more open so, you know, a game, games run well and better, you know, uh, more broadly and you avoid the bad end user experience is, you know, is, might be the right balance in, in that point. So it's you know, NVIDIA is always trying to do um, the smart thing and you know, to be um, closed when it's most effective for our customers and open when it's most effective for our uh, community and customers. It, it's no real religion. We're just trying to you know, do it the smartest way we can. Okay. Um, I've got two last questions. One is going to be for NVIDIA. And one will be the Kronos one. Although the Kronos one's going to be, without a question, the longest one because it's going to tackle uh, neural networks, uh, sorry, native acceleration, deep learning, and a few other bits and pieces as well. So that one's, I'm leaving that one to last. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, this one's more of a, just a general, uh, I guess, question on the state of affairs of computing. And you could, by all means, answer this from the your uh, Kronos hat as well. But... Uh, for mobile, uh, on Nvidia's side, correct me if I'm wrong, you've got the Tegra X1, which I think is based on Maxwell. You're launching Xavier, um, which I, I, I've actually read is based upon the naming of Professor Charles Xavier from X-Men, so I want to know if there's going to be a Magneto song next. <laughs> if not, if not, I, I have some problems with that, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the mobile name, naming has been around you know, X-Men kind of stuff for a long time. Yeah. yeah, okay, you need Magneto on, because he's, he's by far my favourite X-Men character. Just saying, <laughs> just saying. Just but saying. anyway... Could yeah. be noted. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, uh, given the, the specs, um, obviously not all the specs are released, and I don't expect you to comment on stuff that isn't you know publicly available, but it's based on Volta, from what I remember, 512 CUDA cores, it's got L8 ARM V8 cores. Um, obviously, you're looking at shrunk uh, process reduction. On the mobile, uh, sorry, on, on laptop side of things, you've got laptops now which are just insanely powerful compared to what they were just, you know, a few years ago. You, you're looking at, um, I think the NVIDIA implemented the Max Q design, so you've got like a, a, a laptop which has got like a GTX 1080 or what have you. Uh, it's less than 20 a, a, a mm thick. You're looking like 18, I think, and it's got so much horsepower it, it stomps like, you know, a PS4 for example. But 
the question is, like, obviously, with uh, the Xavier, obviously that's going to be more automotive in, in usage. But um, do you think that this is kind of where you expect it to be in terms of performance, or do you do you think you are like not quite as far along in terms of the in terms of performance roadmap, or perhaps you're further along? I think well, the, the way the way to I think understand um, Nvidia's mobile strategy, you know, it's we famously pulled out of mobile phones a while ago, right? Because when Tegra was originally uh, launched back in the day, quite a long time ago now, the you know, mobile phones was one of the uh, target markets that we were aiming the early versions at. Um, but uh, mobile phones, you know, quickly became commoditized, and you know the margins. Uh, were not so interesting. So, but Tegra now is being aimed at um, vertical market segments. So, you know, autonomous driving is perhaps the most obvious one. But there are other you know, uh, robotics in general, drones. You no, know, autonomous devices, I guess, you know, is 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 one big grouping of things that we do. The cars being the highest investment, but there are others too, and the. The configurations and the workloads um, that the, the, the Tegra roadmap is being aimed at you know, is looking at those market segments, not uh, the mobile phones. So in a car, obviously, you have more a bigger power budget than a mobile phone. And even even a drone has a bigger power budget than the, than the typical um, uh, handheld phone device. And so... That, that that is the workloads that we're aiming the various um, Tegra roadmap price points at, not not mobile phones. So if you try to compare the Tegra roadmaps against, for example, you know, the Qualcomm roadmap, you know it, it's not going to look very similar uh, at all. Does would that make sense? Yeah, but would you say that overall performance, like in terms of computing, is roughly where you expect it to be? Like, do you think? Like the actual technology, hardware computing has kind of gotten to the stage where you expected. Like we're at such a level now where, and you know, this is just a general question. Do you think that like the level of performance, like for 4K gaming and all that, was you kind of expecting to hit this level already? I think no. I think the um, the tech roadmap is is pretty tuned to what our customers are asking for. Right now, you know, and in some configurations, I mean, automotive, for example, we actually pair the Tegra with a desktop GPU. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, because you know, it's optimizing the roadmap. You know, do you put a desktop class GPU inside a Tegra? Well, a that might be impossible, <laughs> and still keep it a mobile device. Um, and you know, are there the market uh, use cases that that need that in an integrated device? Well, in in some cases, the answer is going to be you need you need the Tegra for everything that's the that high integration that's in a Tegra device. But if you actually have some applications that say, "Oh, I wish I had desktop GPU performance," well, we've actually engineered the uh, the Tegra we, where we need that. We can actually pair it up with a desktop GPU. So that's you know, rather than overloading the base Tegra with that level of GPU performance, you know, we can deploy it where we where we need it. So I'm going to ask one last question because I, I, this one's probably going to take a while for you to answer. <laughs> so, uh, it's kind of a multi-stage answer as well. So okay. um, last time we spoke, uh, if you if you cast your mind back, one of the things we did talk about is augmented reality. And one of the examples you gave, and a really good example, is let's say that you're in like a, a museum or an art gallery, and you want to display information regarding a, a, a for example, the Mona Lisa. Yeah, that could be a personalized device. So, or let's say augmented reality is that you're walking down the street and you know you've got a Skype call uh, such as this one on your yeah. on your headset, and you're also seeing, hey, like where the hell am I? I'm trying to find uh, Trafalgar Square, and currently I am in Piccadilly. What the hell do I do? So it's telling yeah. you the directions. Now, obviously, some of this is visual, some of this is neural net. So. One of the uh, the cheat sheet that we're both using, the Kronos C Tech, um, one of the things it did say uh, is uh, solving neural net fragmentation. Uh, obviously, not all of this is neural net, but some of it is visual as well. Um, yep. 
do you think that uh, this is like the next big challenge for not just Appies and for you know for um, how can I put it for for programmers and developers, but do you think this is like the next big challenge for society to kind of utilize this and also for people who um, are kind of looking at something like this, how can Vulcan or sorry, how can Kronos kind of help them? That's a great question. <laughs> yeah, I did warn you, it was quite a big one. <laughs> so, um, okay, where, where should we start? So, yeah, <laughs> AR it is going to be cool. I mean, and since we last talked, you know, there's Apple's released you know, AR Kit and Google's released AR Core. And so, you know, there are still lots of people um, interested in AR. And now they're enabled to actually try it out much more easily than they could before. Um, I, I think, um, and you can see Apple not pushing it too hard, which I think is is wise, because I think until we do get the uh, AR head-mounted uh, display, you know, in your AR glasses, uh, I think holding up at the phone, I think we talked about this before last time, yeah. but holding up the phone or the tablet is cool, and it's fun. For, for a few minutes. Yeah, but you're, you, your you're hands not, are just like, it's yeah. not good in Trafalgar Square, like, good luck. You could have, right. like, a broken right. tablet in five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So it isn't good. It's, it's a great step because it's getting the developers into it and you know, there are going to be some really cool demos that come out of it, but it's not going to change the world. Um, but AR glasses are going to change the world. And when we get to that level, um, and as I think, again, as we discussed before, you know, I'm not saying this is going to happen overnight. I think there's a lot of challenges to solve. And one of them is the, um, your AR glasses are going to be need, needing to enable you to interact with your real world environment. And part of that is that your AR system needs to understand the world around it. Now, AR kit and AR core, they started, they give you a ground plane, right? They tell you where the ground is. But, so that's the first micro baby step. But, you know, your applications are going to want, you know, AR kit version 26 in 2029. <laughs> yeah. It's going to tell you, you know, oh, there's a chair over here, there's the person over here, and here's his Facebook profile, and you no. Know, and you know, over there is a Starbucks, and the, you know, the one down the street is, you, you're going to be able to, want to analyze um, the the scene around you and that is going to that is a perfect solution for neural nets so deep learning combined with um, traditional vision processing combined with high performance 3d rendering now it is going to be one part of the uh, overall AR solution and we need to make all of that run at a very low uh, battery consumption which is a big challenge, um, but we are making first uh, steps. And so, okay, I want to run. Therefore, I want to learn how to uh, run a neural network on my um, on my mobile device. It needs to be low power. The in the Kronos ecosystem, the, the API that has taken on that challenge most directly is OpenVX, because OpenVX is when it was first conceived a few years ago. Now, it was uh, a classic vision processing framework. And to remind people, VX is like Lego. You clip together different uh, vision processing nodes and you create a graph of all the vision processing you want to happen in your application, which makes it very portable. And it lets the uh, silicon vendors take that graph and optimize the heck out of it to suit their silicon architecture. Now, since OpenVX 1.0, of course, neural nets have burst onto the scene, and they haven't completely replaced traditional vision processing. But I would say 70% of what to do with traditional vision processing is now better done by neural nets. But you often need to mix two together. You need like traditional camera processing at the front end, extracting the grayscale. You wouldn't typically do that with a neural network. But once you get into the understanding rather than the pixel level processing of a scene, you would use a neural network uh, to do that. So OpenVX, in the latest version, 1.2, which launched back in May, the we have a neural net extension, and soon that will probably be in core. 
And what that does, it lets you use a, the graph to describe a neural net. Because, of course, the, the commonality point, the, real, the light bulb moment is, wait, wait, a neural network, it's a graph. <laughs> <laughs> it is just the graph. And so with very little, we just added tensor objects, which is basically a sort of effect to OpenVX. Now we can uh, define nodes as the different layers in a neural network and use tensor objects to link them together using the standard OpenVX API. Hey, presto, we have neural net descriptions in OpenVX. So that's a, that's a big deal. And you can have those neural net graphs mixed in in the, in the same bigger graph mixed in with um, traditional vision processing. So that's kind of a neat way of describing what it is you want to be executed. Now, the OpenVX, it's, you know, the, the API to construct that graph is literally, you know, here's a block, here's a line, you connect this, this block to this block, this block to this block. With traditional vision processing, you have a couple, you know, a dozen or so blocks with a, you know, a few couple dozen lines. So um, connecting it by hand like that is um, a, you know, a, quite a workable and quite a nice way to do it. A deep learning network, it can be thousands of connections and you know, many, many layers quite complicated topologically. So it becomes pain in, pain in the rear end very quickly to have to link them all together. So that's why we can use NNEF. This is the neural net exchange format that I mentioned earlier. Um, that is an encapsulation of a trained neural network that can be exported directly from a training network like CAFE or T TensorFlow. And uh, when NNEF is finalized, which Again, hopefully before the end of this year, um, OpenVX is very quickly going to follow up with an NNEF import. So you can bring a fully trained network as a blob into OpenVX and then connect up you know, the vision, traditional vision processing you need uh, around that trained network. Uh, you, do you think? Do you think technology such as uh, obviously you have tensor cores in Volta? Do you think technology like that is going to help accelerate this type of thing uh, for, um, for Vulkan and for, uh, sorry, for for um, for a deep learning and general stuff? Do you think it's going to be uh, kind of accelerate things even much faster than what you had originally anticipated back a few years ago? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's it's just a different type of um, um, operation. You know, it's primarily matrix multipliers at different levels of precision. Um, Dedicated hardware can definitely do it. That's why you know, the GPUs are beginning to integrate it in. And you'll see dedicated you know, uh, processors. That's the thing that NVIDIA has open sourced, for example, um, that can do it more more power efficiently and faster than the general purpose. I think it's interesting. It'll be different mixes of traditional architecture and this new blocks of acceleration. Uh, to meet different market needs. Now, if you're, if you want a very low cost AR in your security camera, and a, uh, neural net to say, oh, that's okay. That, no, that's my sister. I don't have to fire the alarm for that. Uh, well, that's the cat. <laughs> maybe you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe you do. Oh, well, that's the cat. So, you know, is, so you go way beyond just motion sensing. You actually, Smartly figuring what's going on. Yeah, You're no, gonna this is my cat. This is, you know, this is this is Bobby, my cat. I'll, I'll open <laughs> yeah. the cat flap. Or right. though, this is like the neighbor's cat who <laughs> happens to like eating out of my, you know, uh, out of my uh, garbage can. The cat flap's gonna remain closed. I've deployed electroshock, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So for that, you know, you're gonna want to pay twenty five cents for your um, new net inferencing engine, and that's going to be the probably dedicated hardware. Towards the, the training end, there, there's still a lot of value flexibility of having some dedicated hardware, but still within the context of a programmable architecture. And don't forget, this is something that the GPU guys have been smart at for a long time now. Now, we started out with a dedicated pipe, then we went programmable, but we've always never been shy to bring to have dedicated blocks of hardware acceleration for the things that hardware is best at. The most obvious one is the texturing engine. So even yeah. when the rendering pipeline went programmable, we, we don't want to do all the, you know, uh, texturing in 
software. That's crazy. Yeah, you wouldn't yeah, do that. Even though you've got like geometry, you know, even though you've got like the, you know, the, the geometry now has moved over and all the stuff, but you know, you've still got texture mapping units, you've still got rasters, you've still got, you know, whatever else. Yeah, that's right. And the hardware can do that way faster. The other examples of the video coprocessor. Uh, the video coprocessor is there. You to get, again, dedicated hardware can do all of the, the, the uh, H.264 type uh, encode decode much faster than trying to do it in general software. The the, the camera uh, processor at the beginning, that's a dedicated hardware block. So having a tensor unit is not like this big break with history. It's just one more dedicated block. But having it in... Uh, within the context of a GPU means you can feed it with data, you can use results back into the GPU, you know, just like you know, all these other hardware blocks that we have. So, so yes, dedicated tensor processing is going to be cool, and you're going to have your 25 cent fix one, and you're going to be <laughs> still going to have, you know, your your um, tensor units in GPUs and GPUs. That's why they've now continue to be an interesting architecture because they they are in many ways the most pragmatic mix of programmability and parallelism and dedicated hardware. Um, so, and if you can afford to build those dedicated hardware blocks into every GPU that ships, then you get tremendous um, economies of scale. And um, it's always been the, that's always been the challenge for dedicated processors. How can I compete with GPUs? Because GPUs are shipping everywhere, uh, but it's such economy of scale, it can be hard for a dedicated single-purpose processor to break in. Um, the only so, major problem, obviously, with GPUs is, or any processor, you've only got a certain amount of die space, so you can't have a, a GPU size, this, you know, the size of like you know your flat-screen television, ultimately. Right. Right. So that there is that, but right. especially now we're starting to get to support the processes anyway. I mean, like you know, it wasn't long ago that we seemed to be almost stuck on twenty eight nm. I, I, I felt almost like the progression had stalled. Obviously, it hadn't, but it was just a, a lot of work to get it down. And you know, then we move into like twenty and uh, sixteen and whatever else, and eventually we're going to be on twelve in the not too distant future. Uh, right. 14, obviously, um, AMD have hit with the Ryzen processors, and there's talk and you know leaks that it's going to go to 12 in the next like you know six months, which obviously you can't comment on. But it, it just shows you, obviously, as this stuff shrinks, you can squeeze more stuff on anyway. Right, but it reaches the point where you know, have you heard of dark silicon? It reaches no, the point. It reaches the point where you can fit so many gates onto a die, you can't afford to turn them all on without the die melting. Wow, which means and this has been a thing for a while, but the um, it does actually mean that uh, well, it's, it's a phenomenon called dark silicon, and it, that you have areas of the um, silicon die that you can't afford to turn them on all on at the same time. So that actually means it makes economic sense to have these dedicated hardware blocks and turn them on only when they're needed, and turn something else off, more turn off the general purpose part, and turn on the the dedicated part. It's basically like clock gating, almost. Right, because you weren't going to be able to use that area and turn it on anyway. So why not use that kind of blank space, that dark silicon for you know, something um, that has may have a specific use, but is you know, super efficient at doing that. So, yeah, it's um, that's been a thing for a while. Right. Uh, I'm really, uh, I'm really aware it's like an hour and 40 minutes for this interview, so I should probably <laughs> let you go. But I'm pretty sure that you're, the guys that you're, you know, in video are gonna be like, where the hell is he? Oh, they were thinking. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, you, you're probably a bit like me, like you're absent, but you're there, present, but not, <laughs> not that absent at the same time. That was but, good. You, yeah. You've had some um, excellent questions. It's been, you know, been an awesome conversation. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd say if we, because obviously it's not like technology is going to stop the progress. I'd say if we have maybe have another conversation like early part of next year, that'd probably yeah. be pretty good. Um, yeah. And then we can obviously go, go through things. I'm going to try and attend. I don't know if you're going to be ever in the UK, kind of attending any of the conferences. You know, the next one is going to be. I walk all, uh, well, at the moment, anyway. The next one is in Edinburgh in the, in the spring. So that's, oh, really? That, yeah, that's definitely when I'll be in the, in the UK. Okay, well, I might actually try and attend that one then, and then we can kind of meet up and do something on camera. That would be kind of cool. 
That would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. be, yeah. Well, I'd better let you go, but thanks very much for the interview, and once again, sorry for the mix-up last time. And that <laughs> no. didn't happen for anyone else who's watching this video. It did not happen. <laughs> I did not accidentally forget the date. <laughs> it all worked out. I wouldn't have had this long on uh, on whatever it was, so it all worked out pretty good. Yeah, okay, so, so we'll just let that slide. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks very much, Neil. Take care okay. of yourself. Uh, Bye. Yeah, you too. All right, thanks.